John here from RightWave Audio, and for this video, we continue on to answer the question, do these new Emotiva XPA DR2 Gen 3 amplifiers sound better than what we were getting with our XP1 Gen 2 monoblock amplifiers? And at the end of the last video, we thought maybe these Gen 3 sounded a little better, even though they were stereo channels and a switch mode power supply versus a monoblock that was running on a toroidal power supply. Well, um, that was only after a short while of listening tests. When we thought about this the next day, we really didn't have a, a pure signal coming into these. And I think that's the best way to do a fair uh, listening test is to strip everything down turn off any filters, any tone controls, and all that. And the best way to remedy with the RMC1 processor is to run things with stereo reference mode. And this is just what we did using an analog input. Uh, when the RMC1 is in reference stereo mode, the subwoofer isn't running, you're not running to tone controls, you're not running Dirac, it's really just the pure signal and uh, any preamp is done on an analog side there. So we feel much better about the way we hook this up eventually to do our listening and measurement tests. We plugged in our Mark of the Unicorn Motu M4 external DAC. Uh, not that the fact that the RMC1 doesn't have good DACs in it, it does, but this will allow us to run REW in a good way. What we did was plugged in the Motu M4 into our laptop running Room Equalization Wizard, REW, and we can also host Apple Music from that same computer. That comes out USB to the Motu M4, and then from the M4 it goes out to the RMC1 with the analog signal and playing back in reference stereo mode. So when we did the test of these amplifiers, we used our ABC switch and we toggled back and forth between the old amps and the new amps. At the same time, we switched between the wires that are driving the speakers from the old amps to the new amps. So both the, the what's feeding the amps and what's coming out of the amps, we had to do those as two different switches. And when we do that, we could do a fairly quick switch between the XPA1 uh, monoblocks, Gen 2, and the Gen 3 XPA, XPA DR2 uh, stereo amplifiers. And uh, we did our, uh, did our measurements. We first did it from our seated listening position, although that does get the influences from the room. So we decided, okay, let's do near field tests. And we did it for both the left channel and the right channel, as you can see, this microphone is in near field positioning, you know, about a foot away from the cones, kind of centered in on where they are, and measured it in the same way for both amplifiers. So we'd, we'd have it on amplifier one, and we do the REW measurement, and then we move over to the amp two, and we did the measurement again, and then we repeated it a couple times there, but then also repeated it for the other uh, speaker. So first the left speaker and then the right speaker. And what we found out is it's very close. We did see the new amplifiers sometimes show a little higher, slightly higher on the high range uh, than the, the old one. Um, but in other cases, um, it was reverse. So, but the difference was uh, minuscule. So we really didn't see much of a difference there from a measurement point of view. And with all this quieted down with no filters and no subwoofer or anything like that, um, there really wasn't much audible difference between the two. Although I still prefer the old XPA1 mono blocks. So they will stay at the front of the room, those three XPA1 one Gen 3 monoblocks will be continue to be in my front left and right center speakers. And these two will go exactly as that was destined to be the side surrounds 
and the rear surrounds. So we'll be doing that next, and so stay tuned here. And I'm going to show you how we had this pre-wired and how we're going to uniquely position these amplifiers at the back of the room, connecting it to the RMC1 through balance cables. So the long length of wire going back to the amplifiers uh, shouldn't make what uh, shouldn't have a negative impact because the, any noise it picks up along the way should be canceled out using the XLR balance connectors. So we'll go show you that next. We are now facing the opposite side of our theater where we have our side surrounds um, mounted. These are fairly old uh, Polk LSI FX speakers. They're bipole, dipole uh, speakers. Not everybody believes in these nowadays. Uh, with, with the immersive audio, some believe that we should just use a, uh, a monopole speakers that are just facing towards the center of the room. But we still have these back from the day when 5.1 ruled the world and they were doing a lot of dipole, bipole. Uh, we still like them, they still sound good. And as I said earlier, we want to move our uh, new Emotiva XPA DR2s to the back of the room. These are currently uh, wired to the front of the room where we have our Sony TAN9000ES with unbalanced connections. So we didn't want to move that to the back of the room as being unbalanced. We didn't want to run that long run from the RMC1. But since the RMC1 is fully balanced outputs and now the XPA amplifiers are fully balanced, we can move those to the back of the room up here is a chase that we have the wires run. We run um, for our wiring, for our balance cables. We run CL3 rated cables that are rated for fire, for in-wall use. Same thing we do with our speaker wire. And when we had these mounted, we knew this plan uh, from the beginning. So what we did was we had stuff behind here, wires that would also go to the back of the room to this other VTI rack that mirrors the one at the front. And we run a four conductor, not because we believe in bi wiring and bi amping, but it doesn't cost that much more to do your uh, four conductors. And now you have an extra pair if something goes wrong, you're good. And while you're at it, you can double up on these and you've got a little more thickness, we rerun 12 gauge uh, wire when we can, and those seem to fit the binding terminals pretty well. If you go thicker than that, it gets more problematic. And so we're going to, we've got these stripped now on both sides, pull these out. We have to switch over the current wiring that's there, unplug those, plug these in the back. There's two sets of binding posts in the back of this, so we'll take all four wires. And for the back, I've got to change this out a bit. I ordered two more uh, nine inch height um, shells. When you buy the VTI rack, it only comes with one nine inch. And we're going to need that uh, extra one for the uh, two XPA DR2s that are eight inches high, give it a little safety factor for some airflow. And so the next thing we're going to be doing is tearing the, down this little mini museum we have with our vintage Sony gear and rebuilding it with the XPA amps tied in to this wiring that we had pre-ready to go and so stay tuned for the next stop. Now we're at the back of the room, we're going to tear this down, rebuild it with the XPA DR2s in high speed. This is that outdoor projector that we use. This is our old uh, CD carousel. And we can't forget our Sony TAN9000ES. And an old Blu-ray player. Now we've got all our wire uh, 
coiled up here that we've got run to the back of the room we haven't used yet. Uh, two wires are for the side surrounds. The other four wires are for the ceiling speakers in case we ever want to power them from back of the room. Right now all the ceilings are still running to the front of the room, but we have them run in both directions, so we have that flexibility uh, to do it in either place. And also back here are the XLR connections to the front of the room, which goes to the preamp of choice, whether that be the RMC1, which is our in-house reference processor, the Marantz Cinema 50, or whatever we might have in test, and we can use our ABC switches to quickly uh, determine what's going to go to these amplifiers. And so we have the blue color uh, pair for the side surrounds and the brown colored pair for the rear surrounds. Uh, the red band means right and the white band means left. And along with this, we have a trigger from the RMC1. So when you turn the RMC1 on, not only does it turn on the front amplifiers, but the rear ones. And then we will use a short cable from amplifier one to amplifier two. And now we have the completed auto trigger for the whole system. So we'll get this wired up. And of course, we're going to have to find the right uh, speaker cables for the side surrounds, strip those out, and wire them to uh, what will be the top amplifier. We're going to move these wires a little bit out of the way. We've got these little things that the shelving goes on, and I'm going to grab one of the 9-inch shelves. The tricky part about this triangular sh shelving is if you have a deep component and you have cables sticking out the middle, they could interfere with it. In this case, we are all set. Now what happened is VTI seems to have discontinued the oak color and now they just have natural. So I have to decide whether I'm using oak or natural back here. But I think I'm going to use the others up front. So maybe if I use the natural in the back, it won't be as conspicuous. Then we get another 9 inch rack. And that will go up here. But before we do, let's get the second unit up there. And get it all wired up. And now we've got to wire the back of this. So what we're going to do, again, um, the right speaker is on the other side of the room. So when we flip this around, we want the right on this side and the left over here. And we got to push down for the balance connection. And then this one is going to get the in trigger from the front of the room. And it's also going to get the cable that's coming from the other. And so we'll go out, trigger down to the second unit. We'll put this on here, but we won't, we won't power it yet until we get all the speaker wire on. So we need to find which ones are labeled. These are the side ones, the silver ones. So we've got to strip these out. This is labeled left. And this is labeled right. So with these four colors, I always um, put red and white together. And then I put black and green together for the negative. 
And we're just putting those together because we're not buying anything. Let's pull that off so we've got plenty of room to just drop this down. And the negative side. And that's in there good, but I'm going to untwist this, there we go, and the other side of this, now before I power this up, I want to connect the um, speaker side. And then we're going to tie the red and white together as we did before, the green and the black. Now with the monoblocks I had two sets of binding posts and I could put each wire on here you only have one for the positive and negative each. And that's all good. And I can flip it around. Now at this point I've got to change the connections from the back of the speaker to be the new wire to these emotivas. So these wire back to the front of the room so we won't be using those. And here we go. Here's the right hand side. Now these we only have for the, for the moment just a single pair so we're going to have to put the jumpers back on these polks. I found the uh, the jumpers, these, uh, this generation of LSI M speakers had these nicer jumpers than the previous generation, just use these. So we'll have to unscrew all this. Cable in here with some banana clips. I can put the second shelf up here. There. That's pretty handsome. And then we just got to do the side surround speakers and get those wired up. At this point, I'm going to take this down off the wall and switch the wires over. It's nice to have something high enough you can rest this on. This is not light. If it was to fall, that would be bad. Take off the wire that was going to the front of the room. So I'm going to do black right on the top. Now these old cables, I don't want to lose. So I'm going to try to tie them to this. I don't want them to fall through the hole. 
And I'm going to carefully get this back up a little brighter so I can see where that should line up. I think I got it. Yep. Always nerve wracking to put it back up on the wall. With the wiring complete, it's now possible to power these up. Put the switch on the back. That's good. Here's the moment of truth. When I push the on button for the RMC1 at the front of the room, do all five amps turn on, including these two at the back of the room? Let's try it. Oh yeah. And off. Nice. So that's the setup. And now I just have to go back to the RMC1, configure our speakers, and move the heights to the old Sony TAN 9000ES. And finally we have seven of the 7.2.4 powered by Emotiva differential reference amps, the two by the Rhythmic subwoofers, and the four by the vintage Sony amp. I'm back a day later after doing my final configuration and doing some listening tests to see what this really sounded like. Now when it came down to the final configuration, there was one thing I didn't mention which made all those amplifiers go on at once. Now the back of the RMC1, you do have four trigger outputs, which is great. And there are, uh, you can go into the configuration of those and determine What's going to happen? Is it going to be the main zone or zone two or both? And by default, uh, the fourth trigger, which I was sending to the back of the room, was configured just for zone two. So I had to change that to include the main zone. Now, I actually disabled all zone two because I'm not using zone two uh, with the RMC1. So all four triggers are now just doing the main zone. So what are we using all four for? And uh, what we do is for the first output, that goes to the three uh, XPA1 mono blocks. And those are run in daisy chain after leaving the RMC1. It hits the first one, second one, third one. And then the second trigger output goes to our first subwoofer at the front left hand side of the room. And the third trigger goes to the second subwoofer on the rear uh, right hand side of the room and then that final trigger in the back. So what I did to troubleshoot this because it wasn't working on the first attempt. So you might have seen in the prior video a voltmeter sitting in the back of the room. What I was doing is I'm trying to measure to see if there's a 12 volt DC signal coming on that trigger when the RMC1 is turned on, and it wasn't. I was getting some floating values all over the place. And then I thought, oh, maybe that's a configuration setting, and it indeed was. So once I had uh, configured that fourth trigger output, not to be zone two, but the main zone, it worked right away. So the voltmeter was helpful. Uh, I was really worried that that long length of wire <laughs> that I put in, or even the terminations were something wrong with them. But fortunately that wasn't the case, it was just the configuration of the RMC1 itself. With the trigger problem solved, what it was remaining to do is take the height channel uh, speaker wire off of the Marantz Cinema 50 and move it up to the Sony TAN9000ES, which also meant unplugging the uh, side and rear surround abandoned wires from the back of that unit and then I could replace that with the ceiling speakers and finally go to the RMC1 into the speaker configuration and finally enable the top front and top rear ceiling speakers there and set the distances which these are all equally uh, spaced from the main listening position so that is pretty good. What I do is, for consistency when I do my reviews, I always set the same speaker distance. So I have a sheet there of the, the from the main listening position to each speaker 
what I'm always going to use when I configure a receiver or a processor. So I can dial that right in. So the last final thing is, how does it sound? Well, this is great. You know, I've been listening to these rear surrounds for many years. Uh, now, they've been powered with the TAN9000ES in the most recent years. And it sounded okay. But, you know, oftentimes I really felt like I wasn't hearing the rear surrounds very well. And I just, was that because of the content? Was it because of my receiver processor? Uh, what was the case that I couldn't hear those so well? And by putting in these differential reference amplifiers for the side and rear surrounds, I believe I've added a new level of clarity and I can have a greater awareness of those sound effects that are going to those rear channels. And this was evident right away when I started listening to content. Now, with a finally, with a good quality amplifier powering the the rear uh, and, and side surrounds. And I know a lot of people say, well, we don't need a great amplifier in the back. Those are just surround channels. But I do really believe that you can get some benefit if you can afford it. And it's taken me a long time. It's taken me over 20 years to get to the point where I am you know, putting this quality of amplifier on my surround channels. And it, and it does make a difference. Of course, now that begs the question about what about my height channels, my first and second row of heights? Should I be you know, upping the game there? I'd probably notice the difference as well, even though there is limited content coming to those channels. I think if I was given a choice between the side and the rear surrounds, I would put the money on the side surrounds. There tends to be, from my experience, more content uh, noticeable on the side surround than the rear surround. So this kind of sums it up for our initial uh, Emotiva XPA DR2 upgrade of our home theater and powering side surrounds. So we now we have seven channels, all differential reference. And this is setting us up for future reviews, uh, comparing side-by-side -side processors, as well as receivers running in preamp mode, uh, to compare how these things really sound. And we're really excited about this opportunity. So what are your thoughts? This feedback would be great to the RipeWave audio community. Do you believe that putting some good power amplifiers, external amplifiers on your surround channels can make a difference? I believe it does, but I'd like to hear from you. What are your thoughts uh, on that uh, upgrade? And of course, uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to this RipeWave Audio community. And if you want to take it up to the next level, look at our Patreon site at www.patreon.com slash RipeWave, and you can hit that bell notification as always in case you want to be notified of when the next video is posted. Until then, keep evolving your audio experience.